Welcome back. So we're going to talk about explicit memories, memories that you can consciously recall. And there's two major types of explicit memories. There are episodic memories, which are memories for episodes of your life, and semantic memories, which are your memories for facts, world facts, general knowledge. And both of those types of memories you can consciously recall. So let's start first with episodic memory, periods of your life, your memories of graduating from high school or maybe getting married or having a child, episodic memories. There's three characteristics of episodic memories that we will talk about in Unit 12. Um, these are the recency effect, and this is a different recency effect from the serial position effect recency effect. Um, reminiscence bump, and childhood amnesia. Actually, the childhood amnesia, I'm going to wait on talking about that and not talk about it in this mini lecture, but in the uh, last one from Unit 12, which is about amnesia. So remember, we're talking about episodic memories, which are autobiographical memories, memories of your own life, where you're able to recall when you experienced something and where you were and what the context was and all of that. So here is a big philosophical question. When you are older and you're looking back at your life, maybe like this gentleman taking a vacation, watching the waves come in, and you think about your life, what will you remember? Interesting question, right? When you look back at life, when you're an elderly person, if you're so lucky, and you look back at your life, what will you remember? Well, it turns out what you remember will depend a whole lot on when you experienced it. So I mentioned childhood amnesia. Um, that's an amnesia that we all have. Very, very few of us can remember events uh, before the age of about four. Um, but what I want you to look at for the purposes of the question of what do you remember when you look back at your life, let's check out this graph. Along the horizontal axis is the age at which an event occurred, and along the vertical axis is the number of memories that you have or the number of events that you can recall from that period of time in your life. And what I want you to see is there's a big hump in the middle, right? Like a camel bump. That's what we call the reminiscence bump. And there's been a lot of research into it. So when you're in your 50s and 60s and you look back at your life, what are you going to remember? A lot from your late teens and early 20s. Yeah, a lot from your late teens and early 20s. Your 40s, eh. Being a little kid, eh, not so much. There's another part of this curve that I didn't explain, but it's not that surprising. The recency effect, it actually is a lot like the recency effect for the serial position effect, um, except that the duration is a lot longer. Remember, we talked about short-term memory um, being the key component of the recency effect for um, lists of words. Um, when it, the recency effect here is a whole different time scale. It's not 15 seconds, it's more like 15 years. So it can be a little confusing that way with the recency effect in the serial position effect curve. So when you look back at your life, you will remember things that happened recently, and you will remember things that happened between the ages of about 15 to 25. And then your 30s, your 40s, one of the really interesting characteristics about episodic memory is that it allows you to time travel. Forget about science fiction. You can do it now. You can travel back in time and think about graduating from high school, graduating from elementary school, maybe your first date, uh, maybe learning how to drive or getting your driver's license. But you can also time travel into the future, right? What will it be like to have kids? Won't it be great when I'm done with college? Uh, what kind of career will I have? What might re my retirement look like? What will the world look like uh, politically in the future? Um, it turns out, and we'll see this a little later, 
that the same brain mechanisms that you use to look back in time at your life overlap or are used by the mechanisms that you use to look forward into the future. So time travel is this really cool aspect of episodic memory. Okay, now let's switch to the other kind of explicit memory, and that is your memory for facts, general knowledge, semantic memory. So your conscious memory of facts, you know, for example, that in the capital of the state of California is Sacramento, right? You know vocabulary, you know rules, like at a red light we stop, and when the light turns green we go. These are all semantic memories that you have. Now, an interesting thing about semantic memories is that we lose the episodic or personal connection to them. So for example, I know that Sacramento is the capital of California, but I can't tell you anything about where I learned that or when I learned it or how it felt when I learned it. Um, now, we've spoken before about um, a separation, a neural separation between episodic memory and semantic memory. And I'd like to return to that now and add a little more context. So we know from patient KC that it's possible to have brain damage that maintains your semantic memory, but you lose your episodic memory. So remember patient KC could tell you what all the rules were for playing chess but he could not tell you anything about himself having ever played chess. And so when he's pushed on that, well, how do you know the rules for the game of chess if you've never played the game of chess? And his conclusion is the logical one. Well, I guess everybody knows the rules for chess, which isn't true, right? Um, patient KC can, re can tell you all the steps that are needed to change a, a tire, a flat tire, but he can't tell you that he has ever himself changed a flat tire. He doesn't have any episodic memories related to flat tires, but he has semantic memories. So um, patient KC provides some evidence that semantic and episodic memories um, rely on different brain areas, but that's just one patient, right? So that's a dissociation. Patient KC, we can dissociate episodic and semantic memory. But it's a lot more compelling if you can find a double dissociation, right? So remember that patient KC lost episodic and maintained semantic memory. Can we find someone who has the reverse condition? And it turns out such a person has been identified. Um, this is a woman in Italy who is known as, referred to as patient LP, and she suffered from encephalitis, which is just a, a swelling of the brain. But as your brain swells, it gets trapped by your skull, and so brain damage can occur. And as a result of her brain damage, patient LP lost her semantic memory, but retained her episodic memory. So patient LP could not tell you what an elephant was or what an elephant looked like or what whipped cream was or where you might use whipped cream. Um, but she could tell you episodes from her own personal life. And that's wild, right? Now, I've said that episodic and semantic memory rely on different brain areas. And this double dissociation really drives that home. But it turns out the story, as is usually the case, is a little less clear than that. There are a lot of brain areas that um, do not overlap with semantic and episodic memory. So there are brain areas devoted to episodic memory. There are different brain areas that are devoted to semantic uh, memories, but they're not 100% different. There are also areas of overlap. And if you look at this 2018 uh, figure from the journal Cortex, You'll see on the far right, the yellow splotches tell you which areas overlap between semantic processes and episodic processes. Now, if you compare the size of the yellow areas on the brain on the right with the extents of neural activity involved in episodic memory and semantic memory in the middle and left figures, 
you'll see that there's not nearly as much overlap as there is separation, but there is some overlap. Okay. Now I said there is some overlap. Well, let's think about that in terms of reality. It turns out in reality, there is often overlap between semantic and episodic memories. And what do I mean by that? Well, knowledge influences experience, right? My knowledge of avocados means that I'm willing to try avocados and eat avocados and have episodic memories of eating avocados, right? So my knowledge, influences my experiences in the world. It also turns out that the reverse is true. Your experiences in the world influence your knowledge, right? So I was lucky enough to travel to Indonesia and enjoy that country. And so now I know a lot more semantic information, a lot more facts about Indonesia um, as a result of my personal experiences there. So they often interact. And if we talk about autobiographical memories, sometimes it's hard to pull things apart. So um, I used to have a note on my door at lunchtime that says I'm probably at Panda Express because I enjoy having lunch at Panda Express. Um, you know, that's a combination, that's a fact, but it's also a fact about episodes in my life. So the separation between episodic and semantic memory isn't um, it's not a perfect separation by any means. And there's some really interesting research on what happens to memories over time um, that leads researchers to understand episodic memories as changing into semantic memories over time. What do I mean by that? Well, this is a study that was done with older people where they were shown a stimulus, maybe a picture of the World Trade Center in New York City um, on 9-11, and they were asked to look at that stimulus and to report, do you remember that event? Do you personally remember that event? So episode, do you have episodic memories of it? Or do you know of that event, but don't remember it personally, so semantic? or do you not remember it at all? So essentially they were asking people to categorize past events according to whether they had episodic memories of those past events or semantic memories of those past events. And the results are shown here. When um, older folks spoke about events or were asked about events that had occurred within the last decade, um, then they had a, you know, a fair number of uh, episodic memories, so remember personal experiences, remembering a particular event or reading a story about that event and being able to remember their part in it. And they had a relatively larger proportion of events that um, they knew about but couldn't actually remember personal connections with it, so more semantic than episodic. But look what, what happens if you compare uh, how, what people remember or how they remember information um, from events that happened within the last 10 years compared to events that happened 40, 50 years ago. So compare the graphs on the left side or the, the bars, the three bars on the left side than on the right side. And what shifts? Well, the number of events that are remembered that you have episodic memories of drops, okay? Um, of course, don't remember increases. That's not surprising. You're less likely to remember something that happened 50 years ago than an event that happened five or 10 years ago. Um, but a big chunk of the drop happens with episodic memories. So how do, and there isn't a big drop, as you'll notice, with facts, with knowledge, right? So there's a big drop with episodic memories, but not a big drop with semantic memories. And what do researchers call that? The semantic, oh, I can never say this word. Semanticization, semanticization. Oh, semantic, have I told you yet that I'm a little dyslexic? Semanticization of remote memories. That is losing the personal connections with our memories as those memories get older and older. It's kind of curious. Okay, 
I mentioned time travel when we were talking about episodic memory, and I just want to circle back and, and address that here. When you look at the brain areas that are involved, um, when you remember past experiences, so old episodic memories, and when you think about or imagine future events, it turns out that similar brain areas are activated in both conditions. It looks like thinking about the future, your personal future, and remembering your personal past involve a lot of the same processes. And we do know um, that uh, causing lesions or damage to the hippocampus is involved or disrupts both thinking about old episodes of your life and imagining future episodes of your life. So there's some overlap there, which is kind of cool. Okay, come back and we'll talk about all of the memories that you have that you're not consciously aware of.